It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? With you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Hello and welcome. I'm Rosanna Lockwood. You're with Talk TV. On TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. This is Prime Time, where we bring you all the stories that matter. On the show tonight, Rishi Sunak faces a growing rebellion over the government's controversial Rwanda plan. In the next few moments, we will hear just how much trouble he is in as two conflicting sides of his party prepare to give their verdict. We'll be live in Westminster with the latest. But could there really be a general election on the cards? I'll be joined by a panel of experts to unpick this latest Tory turmoil. Also tonight, Prince Harry is ordered to pay out thousands in his latest legal battle as the PR war between the Cambridges and the Sussexes is ramped up even further with the release of an unprecedented family film. Plus, we'll bring you our nightly panel looking at other stories making headlines today with financial commentator Susanna Streeter and deputy political editor at the Financial Times, Jim Pickard. This is Prime Time. Well, the Conservative Prime Minister waits tonight to discover if their unruly backbenchers will bring their flagship policy down around their ears. Don't adjust your sets. You haven't gone back in time. Rishi Sunak has staked his personal authority and his premiership on his predecessor's plan to send all asylum seekers and illegal migrants to Rwanda, meaning that his day spent getting grilled at the COVID inquiry today comes at what could be the worst possible moment. As I speak, Tory MPs should be filing out of two separate meeting rooms, one for those on the left, worried that new laws to get Rwanda off the ground go too far, and one for the right, who say they don't go far enough. The feeling very much in the meeting is that the government will be best advised to pull the bill and to come up with a revised version that works better than this one, which has so many holes in it. Now, look, if you haven't been keeping track of the chaos of this Rwanda plan, I really can't blame you. It has been going on a long time. It's been lots of twists and turns. We've been talking about it endlessly. But over the course of this show tonight, we're going to unpick for you why it really matters. If the Rwanda plan squeaks through this vote, MPs will hope to tweak it in every way that they can. The government is trying its best to sound welcoming to that, but with some on the right of the party saying they'd rather just screw it all up and start again, success isn't really a given at this point. And let us remind ourselves, the Prime Minister said that his draft has already gone as far as it can. For the people who say you should do something different, the difference between them and me is an inch, given everything that we have closed. We're talking about an inch, but that inch, by the way, is the difference between the Rwandans participating in this scheme and not. But if the bill does fail, that's pretty much the end for Rishi Sunak's status as head of his party. The Tories are already this dizzying collection of splinter groups now. You've got Common Sense, One Nation, New and Northern Conservatives, and it seems that no one's really at the helm of it all. Rather than being a leader, Sunak would be more accurately ahead of about a dozen committees in Downing Street, but not fully in power. A resurgent Nigel Farage, meanwhile, fresh out the jungle, among the forces that could push him around. The reform chairman demanding that the Rwanda bill be voted down the second he emerges from that jungle. And of all of those long-term priorities we hear about, those will be eaten up by more squabbling among MPs, more infighting. And all of this, of course, amid a cost of living crisis, two wars, and a flatlining economy. It's just the last thing that people in this country want at the moment. It's just see more politicians fighting over a policy that's been in the works for years and hasn't really gone anywhere at all. Now, Rishi Sunak hasn't pledged to call an election just yet, perhaps understandably. We can probably understand that because the polls are saying the Conservatives would face a record defeat at the moment. But if you cannot lead your party, if your party won't follow you, and if it can choose anyone else, 
then giving the public the option would be the sort of traditional moral response. The trouble is, apart from the fact that nobody really wants another election at this point, but Labour found out not so long ago, the public aren't forgiving of divided parties. They also don't like governments that fail to deliver, and nor should they have to. Well, standing by for us is Talk TV's chief political commentator, Peter Cardwell, in Parliament's central lobby, where he's been all day. And, and Peter, we just tried to unpick to our, for our audience, you know, where we're up to. It's, it's a lot to take in, but what are you hearing from MPs tonight? Having connection issues, it seems, with well, was, Peter Cardwell. He's Rosanna, coming back now. Rosanna, uh, in yeah, Rosanna, this is a really uh, febrile atmosphere here in Parliament and there, at the moment this central lobby area that where I'm standing is filling up with MPs from all different sides of the Conservative Party. The breaking news in the last few minutes is that the One Nation Caucus, this is the centrist bit of the Conservative Party, they have decided they are going to uh, vote for this bill or recommend to its members to vote for the bill. Uh, I'm just reading this email which has come through in the last couple of minutes. Its members will uh, vote for the Government Safety of Rwanda bill at its second reading. That's tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. The caucus, it says, remains concerned about any future amendments that would mean the UK government breaching the rule of law and its international or, or obligations and would oppose such amendments in the House of Commons. Well, that means that they are on collision course with those on the right of the Conservative Party. There's quite a few of, sort of subgroups that are also meeting at the same time. The European Research Group, uh, the New Conservatives, the Common Sense Group, lots of different parts of the right of the Conservative Party. And they want amendments or indeed for the bill to be withdrawn. Uh, that's what Marc Francois said earlier. So this is a fascinating clash of the different sides of the Conservative Party. Right in the middle, Rishi Sunak, who is meeting 20 of those right-wing MPs tomorrow morning for breakfast to try to convince them. But people I've been speaking today have been changing their minds from against to abstaining uh, to voting for. So really, this is febrile is the word. People are changing their minds all the time. And actually, James Cleverty, the Home Secretary, he's been on quite an offensive talking to quite a few MPs, not just on the phone over the weekends, but he met them physically about four o'clock this afternoon as well. So the Conservative Party's in crisis. Rishi Sunak, of course, has been focusing on the uh, on the COVID inquiry today. That's really been the main thing that he's been doing. And it's been the people around him, his outliers, people like James Cleverly and his advisors behind the scenes, the whipping operation, the people who deal with discipline within the Conservative Party. We're trying to get those numbers to find out what exactly things look like now. And crucially, crucially, what things are going to look like in a 24 hours' time. So this is a very, very difficult one for Rishi Sunak. The biggest crisis of his leadership, he's only been Prime Minister for just over a year. He's only lost one vote previously. That was actually last week. It was a very, very important thing and the infected blood compensation was very important to the people who it was dealing with, but in terms of his uh, who were concerned, but certainly in regard to uh, the wider scope of his time as Prime Minister, probably not that important, but the five planks that he has talked about, the five, the hugely important things, one of them being stop the boats. This Rwanda bill is incredibly important to that. If it doesn't go through tomorrow, if there are those abstentions, probably 56, 57 abstentions, or if the, there are 26 Conservative MPs who vote against him, well then he's in real trouble because it is a key plank of what he wants to do. If he can't get that through, well then he'll look very, very weak as a Prime Minister and some are even talking about either a leadership election or a general election. Now I think as things stand at the moment, he should probably be just just about OK, but the next 24 hours, Rosanna, are going to be absolutely fascinating. Talk TV Chief Political Commentator Peter Cardwell, thank you. Well, that is the view from Westminster, but what do voters make of all of this? I'm joined now by the doyen of British polling, political scientist Professor Sir John Curtis. Professor, thank you for making time this evening. I just cut to it. How essential is it for Sunat that he gets this bill through? Well, in one respect, the honest truth is that this debate is largely an irrelevance, because if you want to understand why the Conservative Party is running at only around 25, 26 percent in the opinion polls, then you rapidly discover that immigration is not the central issue. The central problems facing this government are one, the state of the economy and the fact that the public blame the government in the wake of the Liz Truss fiasco for the state of the economy to the state of the health service and that we have record levels of uh, waiting times. And three are, yes, queries about leadership. This is where this uh, crisis get closest in the wake of Boris Johnson and Partygate. You discover if you do the analysis that there is no relationship or very little relationship between people's perceptions of whether or not immigration has gone up a great deal or not um, and their willingness to vote conservative again. But, but as you have quite rightly pointed out, 
of course, uh, I, the uh, Conservative Party is widely seen as divided. A majority of those who voted Conservative in 2019 regarded as divided. Um, and the, a divided party is indeed one that is likely to suffer badly at the opinion polls. So in truth, the Conservative Party is at risk of making itself looking even more divided, but doing so over an issue that frankly is not central to whatever prospects this government has of recovering in the opinion polls. I mean, the question I've got to that then next, Professor is why then? Why are they throwing everything at this? Why is Sunak making this this do or die issue? But I know that's not really where you specialise in, but I can ask you with your political... No, no, sure. no it's, it's, oh, perfectly reason it's a perfectly reasonable question. And the, the, the truth is that there are plenty of voters, particularly those who voted Conservative in 2019, who are concerned about the level of immigration. Um, uh, and uh, many Conservative MP is concerned about the level of immigration. And therefore, you can you can not be, not be surprised that in trying to reconnect with many of their 2019 uh, voters who've now gone elsewhere, the government might feel that uh, the issue of both legal and illegal immigration, um, I have to remember that it's the rise in legal immigration that's by far and away having the, the biggest numerical impact on the, the size of our country, um, that they might therefore feel that uh, trying to deal with this issue is a way of reconnecting with their electorate. It's just that if you look underneath the numbers, you discover that yes, while there, there is a lot of concern about level of immigration, this doesn't seem to be the issue that above all is pushing voters away from the Conservative Party. So yes, it, it looks like a good way of appealing to the core vote, but the trouble is, this has not been the reason why you've lost votes in the first place. So it might be that they're quite focused on the voters they might be losing, say, to reform, who focus very heavily on immigration, but not to the but, voters they're losing to other parties that are focusing more on the economy. But even if you look at who is going from conservative to reform, you discover that the issues of the economy and the health service are more important than immigration and identifying those people who are switched from conservative to reform. The people who are switching to reform rather than to Labour, yes, are people who find it very difficult to vote for the Labour Party um, uh, and that, um, you know, they're still, for the most part, or virtually all of them, people who are uh, convinced of the merits of Brexit, whereas those who've gone from conservative to Labour uh, cons consist disproportionately of those people who've lost faith in Brexit. Uh, all of that is true. But again, if you want to reduce the number of people who are going to go for saying they're going to go from conservative to reform, again, the answer it lies in dealing with the economy and dealing with the health service. It doesn't simply lie in, in trying to send out messages on immigration. The trouble is, of course, is that recovering the economy and getting waiting times down in the health service is much more difficult than even passing a law about uh, uh, sending uh, uh, asylum seekers to Rwanda, and even through a divided Conservative parliamentary party. Professor Sir John Curtis, thank you so much for your analysis. Well, for more on this, I'm now joined by the former Technology and London Minister, MP Paul Scully. And uh, Paul, you speak for us tonight on behalf of the, uh, of the Conservative Party, but it's hard to say that you can all speak as one. I know you're not speaking on behalf of a lot of your colleagues, but how will you be voting? Well, I'll be voting for the government. I see this as the only game in town, and I use that phrase really sparingly because it's not really a game. This is a serious matter. It's not serious for those uh, people coming across because of the risk to life, because of the human traffickers. Serious to people who want to tackle illegal Im immigration, stopping those boats, but doing it in a way that actually um, allows us to talk about wider things, about the economy, about housing, about infrastructure, all of those things that are being uh, affected by uh, migration, whether it's legal or illegal. There is no other choice, really, to me. The, tomorrow is all about the principle of the bill, and I think the parliamentary party agrees with the principle of the bill. So that's why we should all be voting for it. What about those to the further right in your party, though, that say there's just no hope for this bill and it needs to be rewritten and started again and be a lot harder? Well, first of all, there's no hope for the bill if they vote against it, if enough the numbers vote against it, that's it. And then, you know, what are you going to come back with? You're going to come back with something harder? Well, first of all, you'll struggle to get that through the Commons itself, but then there is little chance of getting that through the House of Lords where the Conservatives do not hold anywhere near a majority. And the Prime Minister's been really clear that the Rwandans themselves will 
pull out of the deal if it's if there's any sense that we're going to be um, breaking international law, if we're going to be, uh, you know, if, if we're going further to that part. So we've got to be realistic. Politics is the art of the possible. This is um, what's on the table. This is what we should get through. Now, to the extent that the public have had enough of hearing about the Rwanda plan, but, of course, many voters do care about immigration, but... The one thing that everyone was talking about over the weekend was the cost of this thing. This added 100 million being added to the bill. We're going to go into numbers shortly, but now doubling to 290 million pounds. How can you defend that? Well, look, I mean, that was, uh, those, those um, payments were made uh, a few months ago. If you look at what we're spending and what we've been spending every single day, millions of pounds every single day on hotels, keeping people uh, in, in hotels, uh, and that's just unsustainable. So this is the... Uh, I've not heard any alternative plans that are realistic that have any chance of success. This is on the table. We can get this through if people act as a team. I can understand why members of the public are um, furious and frustrated about keep hearing about this. We've got to act as a team, get this through, so that we can be talking about things that are affecting everyday people, their, their cost of living issues, their economy, their jobs, their housing. These are all really important issues that we need to be focusing on. What about the fact that the turmoil in your party and the division, as we were just hearing from Professor John Curtis there, that's putting people off you as well? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's frustrating when, as I say, people forget that, the, you know, the, they always say there's no I in team, but there's five I's in brilliant individual performance. I think people are actually focusing on themselves a little bit too much, and actually we should be focusing a little bit more, first of all, about what's in front of us, but secondly, most importantly, the people that put us in here in the first place, the voters. What, what is it that they're looking for? They're looking for a unified, competent, capable party that's actually looking after their interests and focusing on their interests. Yeah, I agree with that, Paul. Let's see if uh, it can be delivered. We'll be watching the vote closely. Thank you, Paul Scully, MP. Well, next here on Primetime, we'll bring you the latest reaction from one of the MPs in the crunch meeting that could have saved Rishi Sunak's Rwanda plan and his premiership. More on that next. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? 
If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Prime time with me, Rosanna Locker. Let's get straight back into this Rwanda plan saga battle unfolding in Parliament again tonight. The Sun's chief political correspondent, Jack Elson, down there in the central lobby for us. Jack, thank you. And we were just talking to uh, Paul Scully, MP, and he was saying, look, it's the only show in town. You've got to get behind the government on this. He was trying to get his further to the right uh, members behind him on that. Uh, can you see it happening? Well, that's the million dollar question in Westminster tonight. I mean, Richie Sunak really is between a rock and a hard place with this one. His day didn't start out too well when this star chamber of uh, lawyers representing the right wing of the Tory party essentially shot down his flagship Rwanda plan just, just hours to go before it's voted on tomorrow night. Richie Sunak, who's been at the COVID inquiry all day, is going to come back from it with probably the biggest lobbying exercise which he's ever had to deal with in his life as he tries to convince these Tory MPs to vote with the government tomorrow. Now, are they going to vote with him? There's a meeting tonight, 6 p.m. It's still ongoing, as we understand it, in which these caucus of right-wing factions are meeting to decide what to do next. Now, first of all, they could vote with the government, in which case it's all, all happy uh, and all dancing uh, for the government. However, um, they could also vote against or they could abstain. Now, both options are damaging for the prime minister. This is his flagship immigration policy. And it's the second reading as well, where you really only vote about the principle of Rwanda. And so the last person, to, the last government to, uh, to lose a vote in second reading wasn't since 1986. So I think that goes to show if the Tory MP sink this Rwanda plan tomorrow, it's going to be crisis time in Downing Street. It certainly will, and I think a lot of the public want to know the likelihood of whether they're going to see a general election. What, what's your sense, Jack? I think, obviously, there is always speculation of a general election to break the deadlock. We saw that in 2017 with Brexit. We saw that in 2019, again with Brexit. However, I don't think that there's any sort of real serious talk at the moment uh, from Richie Sunak's camp in terms of going early and calling that snap election. I think that while there's always going to be speculation and maybe the threat of going early to the polls to maybe sort of bounce wavering Tory MPs into backing the government, I think that for Richie Sunak, he's still got a lot on his plate. He's still had less than two years, let's remember, in office. I think that while there's always going to be speculation about that, I'm not sure we can be seriously entertaining it at the moment. However, I'll be more than happy to be proved wrong and come back on here and eat humble pie if it happens. Oh, we will serve you up a steaming slice of humble pie if that happens. Don't you worry, Jack. Uh, look, just, just finally, while I've got you, an interesting twist and turn today was Sunak kind of talking to that part of the party, the further right part of the party, and sort of making a statement that it wasn't particularly patriotic, if we can say that. I'm slightly paraphrasing his words here, but to ignore further human rights legislation, and that did not go down well, did it? Yeah, he said that human rights cut to the heart of the uh, British Constitution and we have a long and proud track record of supporting human rights. For some of these MPs who patriotism is a huge deal, that went down uh, like a cup of cold sick, frankly, and it almost riled them up when it comes to their vote tomorrow. And I think that often, you know, when you're trying to sort of corral Tory MPs to voting with you, you get a bit more with, uh, with honey than you do with vinegar. And I think that Downing Street would be wise to remember that before they go riling these Tory MPs. <laughs> Jack Elson, uh, a master with the words there this evening. Thank you very much from the lobby. Now, last week, Rishi Sunak revealed uh, this new law declaring Rwanda a safe country, and this was all an attempt to revive his Rwanda scheme. He wants to see asylum seekers that arrive by small boat crossings, illegal migrants, deported to that African nation. Well, today, Tory MPs, as we've been telling you, on the right of the party, have called on the government to scrap all this together just 24 hours. This was this morning before. It's due to be voted on in Parliament tomorrow. And all of this amid rising taxpayer-fronted costs, despite no flights having actually taken off, but we'll have more on the money in the moment. First, though, in the face of all of this, can this plan legally 
Even Work, joining me to discuss this legal affairs commentator, Joshua Rosenberg, KC. Thank you, sir, for making time. And um, in terms of where we are at, I mean, it's hard to pick a point, but the latest draft that Sunak wants to get passed, um, how likely do you think we will ever see that see the light of day? The bill was published last week, and as you've been reporting, it's going to be debated tomorrow. Uh, the question you're discussing is whether it's going to get its second reading, whether MPs are going to vote for it uh, tomorrow night and send it off to committee after Christmas. Uh, there are uh, pressures on the Prime Minister to amend it, as you've been reporting from uh, European Research Group. Its star chamber of lawyers has said uh, that the bill uh, is not watertight and doesn't go far enough. Uh, but you've also got the One Nation Tories, uh, centrist Tories, who say if it went any further, they wouldn't support it. And more importantly, perhaps you've got people in the government. You've got the Attorney General, Victoria Prentice. You have got the uh, Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice, Alex Chalk. Uh, and if this bill went the way that uh, is being pressed on Rishi Sunak, uh, I, I suspect they might walk out and the government can't afford to lose the Secretary of State for Justice and the Attorney General. So that's why uh, Rishi Sunak has done a rather unusual thing today, which is to put out uh, his uh, legal grounds for arguing that this is the right thing to do, uh, that this is lawful, and by implication, if it were to go any further, it would be a breach of international law. Well, let's analyse for a second. The, the, I, I sort of keep referring to them as this, but it's the only way I can describe the further right members of the party who have today said, just, just screw it up, start again, rewrite this, we want a harder version. The Star Chamber of Lawyers backing them up as well. I mean... How likely is it that something like that could be passed into law in the UK if we're going to assume it's going to be disregarding further elements of, say, the Human Rights Act or ECHR? Well, as you've been reporting, it's not even uh, a done deal that this version of the bill is going to be approved. Uh, you've been hearing about the difficulties it will face in the House of Lords if it ever gets through the House of Commons. Uh, and if it were to go further, um, then I think it would uh, run into great difficulties. And if it were to be passed by Parliament, it would run into even greater difficulties uh, with the courts. Uh, one of the arguments that's been put today is that until now, we've always assumed that Parliament is sovereign and that the courts will do what Parliament says. Uh, and one of the arguments uh, uh, that's been put is that if you push the courts too far, if you pass legislation which, for example, totally excludes the right of people in any circumstances to go to court, well, then the courts will begin to question the sovereignty of Parliament, and that will lead to an unravelling of the British Constitution. So uh, if, you, uh, if you go any further, uh, you are, um, you're in deep waters. Well, uh, just if we could just ask you to give us your view then on this... Um sense uh, that Sunak gave that he believed that anybody who did want to go further would be unpatriotic? Well, that's a political term, isn't it? Uh, I, I don't suppose that that uh, is uh, something that uh, a lawyer is really going to argue one way or the other. The real question that I want to address, if, if you'll forgive me, is whether if the bill goes any further, it will get through Parliament. Uh, and I think uh, far from it. I think if he were to rewrite the bill if he were to take away this possibility of going to court in the most extraordinary and exceptional circumstances uh, as the government would say uh, although the erg the uh, star chamber say it's enough to delay uh, cases uh, and that will lead to uh, flights being delayed but if, if the government were to go further, then the bill certainly wouldn't get through Parliament uh, and uh, you wouldn't be getting any people uh, removed to Rwanda at all. Joshua Rosenberg, KC, thank you for joining us to do legal analysis. Next here on Prime Time, we will be staying with this story and we will be getting a little bit more analysis on the cost of this plan as well. Later on in the show, we'll also be discussing Prince Harry. He's been ordered to pay the mail on Sunday more than £48,000 over his libel case and asking, is it all over for Brand Sussex? Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. You're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using Excel bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Sport Today? 
They do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to Prime Time. Let's return now to our ongoing coverage of this growing rebellion Rishi Sunak is facing over his controversial Rwanda plan. Let's talk about the cost now, because I think that matters to a lot of us. Originally, the plan was billed at some £140 million. But as the Home Office has been ordered to disclose the full costs of the secretive deal, it has emerged that the UK has paid a further £100 million to secure this scheme, taking the bill to £240 million. And Sir Matthew Rycroft, a civil servant in the Home Office, revealed that a further £50 million will be paid to the African nation in 2024, bringing the total to some £290 million. Pounds. That's where we're at at the moment. How do we feel about all this money being spent? That's my question next. Joining me in the studio uh, is somebody from Labour Together because Labour leader Keir Starmer has said this hugely expensive scheme is wrong and will be reversed if the party wins the next general election. But have they got a better plan? Labour Together is a highly influential think tank that works closely within the party and their director of strategy, Josh Williams, joins me now in the studio. Josh, thank you. I mean... In terms of the costing of this, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, you've got to start with the scale of it. So £290 million, pounds, uh, that is about a quarter of all of Rwanda's exports in any given year. So we have thrown a crazy sum of money uh, at the Rwandans for a plan that has not got a single plane off the ground. If you wanted to buy a whole load of plane tickets, you could fly 77,000 people to Rwanda with that much money. We haven't flown anybody to Rwanda. It is a colossal amount of money to have wasted to no great end. It is extraordinary. Rwanda seems to be um, benefiting currently from all of this, given that they haven't had to provide the service for which we have paid them a lot of money for. That's not me criticising Rwanda. It's more just looking at the state of the scheme where it currently is. You can understand why the average voter is wondering at this point where, where this takes us. 
But I will say this, um, ask you with regard to Labour. We had Paul Scully MPs, Conservative MP, on the show just a few minutes ago, and he said, look, you've got to get behind this. He was talking to his Conservative colleagues because there is no other option for dealing with this illegal migration issue. I haven't seen a better plan. What do you say to that? Well, I actually think Labour have set out a very clear plan. So Yvette Cooper and Stephen Kinnock have both set out this five-point plan for migration and asylum. At Labour Together, we've tested these two plans against each other. So we've put the Labour plan up against the Conservative plan. And we see that when the two plans are placed side by side, uh, voters are moving towards the Labour Party. They're also moving away from the Conservative Party and off to reform when those two plans are put side by side. So if you ask the voters, the voters think there are two very separate plans here and they prefer the Labour Party plan to the Conservative plan. What is the Labour Party plan? Spell it out for our viewers. Oh, well, five points is an, is an awful lot of uh, points for, for the public to, uh, to remember. But essentially, what is happening is the five-point plan is going to smash the gangs in the first instance. So it's all about putting in a cross-border police force, working with the French uh, on that. Uh, to that, I will say uh, that has been tried, Conservatives would say, and they just don't seem to have made much progress. So. I think it's worth remembering that a Conservative government and a Labour government would be quite a different proposition. There is uh, no love lost, I think, between the uh, Conservative government as it is now and the Europeans. And I do think there's an opportunity with a change of government to sort of reset the negotiation. Um, and the, the broader Labour Party plan, the rest of the five-point plan, which involves uh, both resettling migrants, so sending migrants back to well, returning migrants are sending migrants to France to be processed in return for resettlement of migrants who have an existing relationship with the United Kingdom. There's a bit of give and take there, and that makes a difference. And I think that's why the Labour plan is deliverable and the Conservatives, I, I don't think, have a deliverable plan. And I stopped plan. you there. You've got, you've got four more points to list, two, three, four and uh, so five. I've got one, Go two, on. three there. There's a OK, two, one, two, three. <laughs> OK, so in terms of the delivery of that, why do you think the message hasn't landed as much? You say voters are moving across and the polling is telling you that, but just anecdotally sometimes you hear, especially as a reporter, you know, a reporter's going out speaking to voters and saying we're not quite sure what Labour's migration policy or plan is. Why do you think it hasn't landed? Well, I think it's early on, you know, we're not in the election campaign yet, and therefore people are not switching on in a big way to the, to the uh, propositions that are set out by both parties. You don't tend to get a lot of awareness of the opposition's plans until you're in the fight and the heat of the election campaign. What we do know is that the Labour Party polls six points higher on migration than the Conservatives do. That is incredibly rare. Um, you know, on the whole, the Conservatives poll higher than the Labour Party, even when Labour is in government. Right now, Labour has the lead. So they might not be able to remember all five points of the plan, um, but right now they trust the Labour Party more than the Conservatives on this issue. Josh Williams, Deputy Director of Labour Together. Thank you. Well, next here on Prime Time, we will stay with this story. We'll be live in Central Lobby with the latest from those meetings that are happening. Stay with us for that. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegan's about. The 
weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideologies? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They're that right. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back. Uh, while the One Nation members of the Tory party might be backing the government reports emerging that the hardline MPs on the right say they not only are prepared to vote against the Rwanda plan, they're also sure that they can defeat it as well. It's the right state at the moment, actually pretty divided. Let's go to Central Lobby, where the Conservative MP and One Nation caucus member Damien Green is standing by, so thanks for making time. Look, we're hearing that your colleagues in the new Conservatives and Common Sense group think they can defeat the government's plans tomorrow. What's your reaction to that? Well, I, I've just heard that as well. Um, if, if they do that, I think that they would be wrong and, and foolish to do so. Uh, the government has produced um, a very tough uh, policy on Rwanda that just about uh, stays within the, the, the legal boundaries, uh, which is why we in the One Nation group are supporting it. Um, and I think uh, anyone who votes against it uh, will be it will be jeopardising uh, the, the immigration policy that they, they say they support. How has it got to this state that you have such division and such extremities of views within the party that you can't even agree within one bill amongst yourselves? Uh, the general voting public will be at a loss to understand what the Conservatives are at the moment. Well, I think uh, I'm supporting the bill, so that's perhaps a question best put to one of my colleagues uh, who says they're going to oppose it. It's clearly it's one of the Prime Minister's five big priorities, stopping the boats. The Rwandan scheme is a step towards that. It's part of the, the toolkit the government is using to do that. It's an important part. Um, and so we've looked at this bill uh, and said we're going to support it. If, if others take a different view, uh, that's for them. But I think they're wrong to do so. Does this boil down to Rishi Sunak and his style of leadership? Some are saying that, you know, the lack of leadership at the helm has allowed these divisions to splinter and multiply. Well, I think uh, there, are, there are genuine differences of view uh, about how best to achieve what we all want to do, uh, which is you know, more control over illegal uh, immigration into this country. Uh, so I don't think you can particularly criticise the Prime Minister. Those, uh, those variations of view uh, have always been there. But as I say, the government has produced a plan. Uh, there is no other plan that, that meets our legal obligations. Uh, certainly, you know, none of the opposition parties have got a plan to stop uh, illegal migration at all. Uh, so that's why, uh, in the end, uh, we've decided for all our concerns about uh, Britain's commitment to the rule of law and our international obligations, we in the One Nation Group have decided we want to support this and that we think is the sensible and pragmatic thing to do and also uh, will help the Prime Minister uh, restore some stability in this area uh, which is such a key area for so many people. How confident do you feel that others are going to vote along with you tomorrow? How well are you going to sleep tonight? Uh, I, I, I'm sure I'll sleep fine tonight, but um, I think uh, that yeah, there, there is often tough talk. Most, yeah, just historically, uh, most rebellions are less uh, effective than the people promoting them uh, suggest they will be. So I, I still think this bill will go through. 
And earlier on in the show, um, we were speaking to Professor Sir John Curtis, who, as you know, is a, a, a doyen of polling, and he was talking about where the Conservatives are putting their focus at the moment and what the voters care about. And while some voters do care, of course, about immigration, a lot care more about the cost of living and the economy. So do you feel like your eye is somewhat off the ball here? Well, I, I, I mean, I agree. I mean, it, I, yeah, I can read polls as well. And, and clearly, uh, the economy is the number one issue and the NHS is number two and immigration is often uh, number three. So it, it's an important issue, but it's not the only issue. And I would much rather be arguing about the success of the government uh, in bringing down uh, inflation and, for instance, the improvement in our educational scores, the fact that our children are better educated uh, than they have been for a very long time. Uh, so there are indeed other subjects I would like to be uh, talking about all the time, but immigration is an important issue. We have a bill in front of us that uh, would help control illegal immigration, which you know, is, is a big issue for, for many people. And so, as I say, I think the sensible thing uh, is to get behind it and support it. Damien Green, MP, speaking just from the lobby this evening. Thank you. Well, to have a bit more discussion on this, I'm joined in the studio by my panel, of which tonight we're joined by the Deputy Political Editor of the Financial Times, Jim Pickard. Also with us to speak about other headlines today, financial commentator Susanna Streeter. And before we get on to some light affair, let's just get your views, Jim, on what is happening <laughs> in lobby at the moment. You've seen a lot of these types of debates, but it, it could be pretty tough for Sunak in the coming week. So my thoughts on this are that, firstly, it's reminiscent of the Brexit period, that, that sort of sense of people running around trying to work out how votes are going to go, everyone looking a bit kind of frenetic and chaotic. I think the second thing is that Rishi Sunak thought that by increasing the salience of those boat crossings in the English Channel, he would be able to look as if he was tough on immigration and the kind of guy who got results. But it's gone very badly for him. I think for people who think that it's a, a disgraceful policy to be sending asylum seekers all the way to a despotic regime in Rwanda, they're not going to like it. And the other people voting public who think it's a great idea to send people to, to Rwanda, they're going to feel frustrated because he seems to be unable to do it. So it makes him look weak. So I think politically, it's looking really bad as well. I think on the specifics of the vote tomorrow, we still don't really know how it's going to go. The, the statement that seems to be coming out from those five right-wing conservative groups, I don't know why they're split into five. I don't know if they do it to make themselves look bigger <laughs> than they really are. And I think there's some cross membership within those groups. They seem to be saying they have the numbers to vote down this legislation. I'm not sure they've definitely said yet that they will do so. So it's like a game of chicken that we're in at the moment where they're trying to force the government's hand, get some concessions. But from Rishi Sunak and Downing Street's perspective, there aren't many concessions you can give before you're actually starting to threaten to leave the European Convention on Human Rights and possibly break all sorts of laws. And then you alienate the more moderate, centrist, one nation Conservative MPs. So Sunak is in a bit of a bind and he's stuck in this, this game of chicken. When I hear terms like Star Chamber and Rebels, you know, I start thinking we're talking about Star Wars here. I mean, it, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to belittle what's going on, but I'm trying to think about this as a viewer of this programme or as somebody who is going to go head to the voting box next week and, or sorry, next year rather. <laughs> There's me, um, you know, subconsciously really pulling on an early election. Um, but we've been talking about throughout the show what this means in terms of the polling and favourability for the Conservatives at the moment. We know where the polls are. They're very, very far behind. Do you think there's any way that Sunet can make this up at the moment? So the one thing I would say here is that you can be 20 points behind in the polls and people can presume that's what the result will be when we go into an election in a year's time. But all the polls tell you is how people feel generally right now. And it's no secret that people are fed up with the Conservative government. We're in a cost of living crisis. We have mortgages going up. They're only going to keep going up as you have the ratchet effect of people coming off their fixed rate mortgages and all the rest of it. But what the polls don't tell you is that in a face-to-face -face contest between Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer, which leader and which party do you prefer? And you only really get that feeling when you get into the final six weeks or 10 weeks of a, of a campaign. And if you look at previous elections we've had, if you look at, for example, 2017, Theresa May went into that with a poll lead of over 20 points. She saw it as a chance to kind of get a larger majority, basically. And the public thought that was very arrogant and they punished her. And there are all sorts of examples from Australia, Germany, um, different elections around the world. And Morgan McSweeney, who's the uh, kind of poll strategist for the Labour Party, did a bit of a presentation to the Shadow Cabinet only a few days ago, showing them all those different polls from 
previous contests where people looked like they were miles ahead and then they lost it in the final furlough. So for the Labour Party, there's no sense of complacency. But for the Conservative Party, they're clearly very, very worried about losing their seats and having a 1997 moment. Yeah, and we all know what it's like to be surprised, don't we, Susanna, when it comes to voting, when it comes to referendums, uh, when it comes to elections in this country. Um, and I know we introduced you as a financial commentator, but you've been a journalist for many, many years. It, it, when you're watching how this is going down, what are your thoughts? Well, it does look uh, as though Rishi Sunak is in a very tight spot. He's been interrogated at the COVID inquiry. Meanwhile, his Rwanda policy is under interrogation. Everywhere he looks at the moment, he seems to be under fire. I think he's really going to stumble through this because certainly it does seem as though there isn't really an alternative because nobody else, I think, in the Conservative Party is going to want to take up the baton at this time when the Conservatives are trailing in the polls to this extent. They'll want to kind of keep their powder dry and if they are in opposition, then put themselves forward. So I do think he's probably going to soldier on unless, of course, you get some kind of, you know, somebody coming back in. Boris Johnson has been mooted. I do think that's unlikely. I think we're probably just going to see Rishi Sunak struggle through this. It's amazing when you when I ask guests in the studio about the chances of a different kind of leader coming through the party. No one can really name one at the moment. Look, in terms of other views on what is happening, we're hearing from celebrities as well. Gary Lineker, of all people, and succession star Brian Cox. They are among a list of celebrities that have called on the government to scrap this Rwanda plan in a letter signed ahead of tomorrow's vote. Political leaders have been urged to come up with a fair new plan for refugees. Now, the Defence Secretary has actually hit back, saying Lineker should stop meddling. Uh, I'm going to ask you both, should he? I mean, uh, should celebrities be wading into this? Are they providing a bit of clarity even, Jim? So I feel that people should be free to speak their minds unless their role is objective political reporting for the BBC, let's say. Mm. You, know, you wouldn't expect Chris Mason to be speaking his thoughts to, to the wider world day in, day out. But I think, you know, Gary Lineker's a, foot, he's a football pundit who happens to have strong political views. I'm sure there are plenty of celebrities on, on the right wing of politics who also speak their views. And I think it's a bit weird when right wingers who talk all the time about freedom of speech are so keen to silence Gary Lineker. What is it about Lineker that they find so offensive that they want him to shut up when they also, <laughs> on the other hand, talk about free speech all the time? I think it's his popularity. That's why they want him to mm. shut up. And certainly I do agree with you. I think there should be a line drawn. Obviously, if you're presenting the news, if you're a, a political commentator working from the BBC, you do have to be impartial. I do understand that, having worked for the BBC myself. But you look at the hundreds and hundreds of contributors and presenters that the BBC employees, many of them freelance, and, you know, it's quite difficult to really, you know, have a handle on all of them, every single tweet that they send. Certainly if you're high profile working in news, I do think a line uh, needs to be drawn. But if you take it to, it to this level, you'd be seeing somebody who works in a gardening programme or, you know, shifts bags of cement in a, in a DIY programme, they can't even have a view either. So I think it's gone a little bit too far and it's really important that we have freedom of speech in this in this country. And also I think this is a, diver a diverse Version. That letter, you know, it did also state, let's look at how we can integrate refugees better into society. We've got lots of jobs that need to be filled, particularly in social care. And also look at the causes of why refugees are coming here in the first place. Let's look at innovative solutions like debt for nature swaps to help these countries get back on an even keel. And then, then that may prevent uh, more refugees coming in the future. Acting like it is, right now is just no long-term solution, I'm afraid. Cat celebrities, these celebrities, uh, feel like they're just speaking on behalf of people in the country who haven't spoken up. I don't know. I think it's interesting uh, to get their point of view. And as you say, in a democracy, free speech, the rest of it, no harm in them piping up. Now, next, let's stay with politics, but bits of celebrity politics. Leading Brexiteer and jungle runner-up Nigel Farage has today dismissed speculation he could join the Tory party, saying the Conservatives under Sunak are a total shambles. He was speaking to ITV after his third place finished in the jungle. He said the Tories are heading to total defeat in the general election. He did, however, stop short of ruling out joining the party under a different leader. And Reform UK, of course, would probably take him back. I mean, he was basically not to be held to anything in this interview, Jim. He was sort of saying, well, anything is possible. Anything mm. is possible. He's keeping all his cards on the table. Where do you think we'll see him? I mean, that is very farage to keep people guessing the whole time and mm. to, to be this kind of charismatic presence who 
You're not quite sure how he's going to jump. Interestingly, when he was in the jungle, he was not a particularly charismatic presence. I actually watched quite a lot of I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here, and he seemed very kind of subdued. He wasn't really taking part in the banter or the fun that the rest of the, the camp mates were taking part in. I thought in a way that, that it might have actually suppressed his popularity a little bit. But So I was surprised when he came in third. It's not impossible that his political party, Richard Tice's political party, was sending out emails every day begging supporters of Reform UK to, to lend their vote to Nigel Farage. In terms of what he does next, it's an interesting question that if you did have a different leader who was more right-wing, would they bring him back, maybe stick him in the House of Lords because he seems to be very bad at winning parliamentary seats? He's tried about five times and, and failed. So maybe you could do a Cameron, stick him in there. But at the point that you have him in government, in a Tory government, you may win back some red wall voters, but you may also lose some kind of more moderate, uh, liberal-leaning traditional Conservative voters. So it's not the kind of election-winning masterstroke that his supporters pretend that it would be. Susanna, very briefly, because we're just running out of time, did you watch Farage in the jungle? No, I decided not to watch it, actually, um, without putting too much more publicity and viewers into his appearance, actually. Um, he's gone really, hasn't he, from dealing with snakes in the jungle. He'll have to deal with snakes in the grass at Westminster. I, don't, <laughs> I think this is a short burst of popularity. And uh, as we've seen, you get that if you've been on a, a, I'm a Celebrity and then it yeah. dissipates afterwards. Susanna Street uh, and Jim Pickard in the studio, thank you. Piers Morgan standing by. And you know what, Piers? I know the Americans will have a reality TV star as their leader, but I didn't think we would. Well, we're not going to. I mean, Farage is a serial loser who's he's lost six times, remember, elections in this country. And he just lost a I'm a Celebrity series with the lowest ever ratings because he was in it to a bloke I've never heard of, who apparently was in Made in Chelsea 10 years ago, right? If that is apparently the new barometer for becoming our Prime Minister, well, you, you can sleep with the birds. It's nonsense. Anyway, apologise for my voice. I'm going to be singing Barry White tonight. It's good to see you back. Uh, Piers, I'm back on the love train. <laughs> I hope you're feeling better, Piers. That is all we've got time for on Primetime. Piers Morgan Uncensored up next. Good night. The world's number one interview show, the new global home of big debates and big questions. This is really unfair. Why? We'll explain why. For all the big names. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. You're going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, of course, I cannot continue my work. Did you feel Elvis was a controlling influence on you? And the good news? You've already found it. All new Piers Morgan Uncensored, right here, Monday to Thursday, 8 p.m. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. 